It all starts with the raw material on the ground. You know, you got to have great raw materials from the growers. Otherwise, there's only so much I can do to it afterwards, just like cooking great food. you got to have great raw materials. Well, I think the herb industry is a bit like the food industry or the you know, clothing industry to a degree. You can, you can buy off wholesalers that you can just sell a product from, and you don't necessarily know where that ingredient comes from, or you don't have a relationship with the growers or the earth where they come from. Or you can really try and, you know, dig deeply into your supply chain. In Europe they have at least two tracks. One track is highest grade gets shipped to Germany, whatever they reject gets shipped to the United States. As the FDA defines um, the good manufacturing procedures as a concept of minimum competency. So they don't have to be of a therapeutic quality. In Europe, they have to be of a therapeutic quality if they're going to be dispensed therapeutically. Therape therapeutically effective is not part of the GMP. The GMPs state that I just need to make sure that I have the correct genus and species of ginkgo leaf. So I could literally take old, brown, improperly dried and harvested ginkgo leaf and as long as I identify that and make sure that the microbiological contaminations within reason uh, and there are no other adulterants in it, I could market that ginkgo leaf into the United States per GMPs. But I choose not to do that. I choose to have viable, efficacious medicine, which means I have to go to more extreme lengths in finding high quality, therapeutically effective medicines. This is a good example of why it's important to cultivate Brahmi, because most Brahmi, the copa, grows wild and damp, waste, water. As you can see here, there's bits of rubbish, dirty stagnant water. You know, it's not the place that you want to get your medicinal herbs from, really. Well, the mainstream supply chain, um, unfortunately, it still invites a lot of problems. Um, you know, pe people talk about all sorts of quality problems and regulatory problems and litigious problems and, you know, I hear about these things and I just say, well, the answer is pretty simple, really. You, you find out where things come from, you go there, you meet people, you develop relationships and you visit and you, you know what you're buying and you can avoid a lot of problems that so many American companies find themselves in all the time just because they do anonymous buying. They do price buying and they don't know where anything comes from. If you invest in quality assurance and sustainability, you can get rid of most of your problems. I know that the, there is a, a strength that is given to a community when there is a, a set of ideals in a way or a vision to aspire to. And for me that's what's important is that our partners and the people we work with have that intention. And because we work in the organic community, at the heart of what everyone does is this vision of making the world a better place. And I know that's a broad idea, but essentially through looking after the earth, looking after the environment, looking after the ecosystem, your intention is already so positive um, that I think that is embedded in the plants. We have to get interested in economic and social sustainability standards to implement alongside organic standards so that you cover uh, indicators and criteria for uh, all, all three legs of the sustainability stool, economic, social, and environmental. Being committed to doing things sustainably and organically and supporting fair trade practices takes into consideration of not only the, the end product and the health that we hope that our customers will, will benefit from, but also the health of the communities of where it's coming from and also the health of the environment.
this. It's not just looking at something that is, you know, got strong chemical constituents. It's also being in relationship with the plant. So if you have that health and wellness built into your system, and then it's the relationship between the farm and the buyer or the farm and the herbalist or the company, like if that's well and healthy and strong and respectful, then that builds more wellness. And then that gets all the way down. It translates into the medicine. I think if you buy something organically, I think you're going a long way in that direction. There's no doubt that that is a, a form of kite mark that is recognising some integrity within the supply chain. If you buy something that's fair world certified, you're definitely going to have that. If you buy something that's fair trade certified, you know that to a, to a degree the people have been cared for a bit. There's some conscientiousness going on there. I believe that every person who comes in contact with the plants from the wild collection all the way through the post-harvest handling and processing and shipping to the final users has an impact on the quality of the medicine in terms of its life force. We try to assess what are some of the price points you know, in these raw materials. and. There are some folks, they're charging such a small amount of money uh, for their raw materials that you become suspicious about you know, how that trickles through to their employees. In the old days, I remember opening up sacks of certain herbs that came from certain countries and always weighing out the amount of rocks that were in each sack. And, and I found that the amount of rocks in each sack always weighed exactly the same. That's called economic adulteration. That's intentional. Uh, because perhaps they're, they don't believe they're getting enough for what they're selling. So if you take care of that right up front, you improve quality all the way around. I think agriculture as a whole, all agricultural products are undervalued in, in the United States. I think we just expect it to be cheap, and I'm all for people being, let's feed everyone, but we still have to value what the actual cost is. You know, if you're buying the cheapest food, you're probably not getting the food that has been grown and managed in a way necessarily that is looking after the whole context of the cost. When someone comes to me or mentions to me, for example, that, that, uh, that they got a great deal on something and they tell me the price and it just seems too good to be true, I say, well, it sounds like someone got screwed. I think we were surprised at how much work it was. We were surprised at how undervalued it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're ready for the work. I mean, we yeah. work. We're hard workers. You have, you go through all that time and then you have to bargain for how much something is valued. Mm -hmm. You just think, wow, obviously there's not that connection. And so how do we build that connection, right? There are some young farmers in the United States who are growing medicinal plants and, and making a go at it. Uh, so there, there's hope. Uh, I see here and there, but in the traditional wild collection areas around the world that for the past hundred years have been the main areas of supplying medicinal plants for the global market, there's ghost towns and, and elderly people that are still there doing the work. A lot of collectors of herbs are marginalized. You know, they're marginalized sort of geographically. They live on the edge of society physically. They're marginalized socially. They're often uh, living in economically deprived areas. Um, and the, the cost of the herbs in a long supply chain is often quite cheap at the source and so they don't get paid a lot of money for their work and so it means a lot of the younger generation aren't that interested in carrying on that tradition. And the overarching issue in my view is the absolute necessity for long-term survival of species including humans of biodiversity conservation. So but that can tie in, that links into everything, because some of the theories for biodiversity conservation are that local people are, are part of the solution. So if you can then create sustainable enterprise, which mm. employs the people who would otherwise be the perpetrators, and then they mm. become the conservers, then um, that's a really exciting area. Kind of. mm. I'm a big proponent of, of sustainable wild collection, because I see that as a way that people, consumers, if they're educated, can support companies who get it to help protect some of the last remaining pristine ecosystems in the world. 
So when we're selling keys in supermarkets, what we're doing is raising funds for conservation. And uh, that's a really exciting conservation strategy. Mm. So it's not just about doing business differently, it's also about merging the two worlds. I think in the past it's been apparent that you could harvest and take out what you wanted because the volumes weren't huge, but as we grow as a population size, and also as actually herbalism becomes more popular again, which is a fantastic thing, but in that process, nothing could be worse than us trying to promote awareness around using plants and then for us to harm the earth in that process. It's larger than commodities and money and products. Um, it's how we steward the earth. It's being in relationship with a plant and that relationship will heal us and then we also have a responsibility to take care of the, those plants and the ecosystems that they grow in. I think we should all really be thinking hard about where we you know, spend our money and who we're spending it on, so to speak, so that uh, those values that we want to promote in the world do get promoted. Because if we end up supporting the people that we're not particularly fans of, then that world won't change. <laughs> Yeah.